Thank you very much, and um, good morning to everyone here. Uh, I certainly agree with the uh, last speaker. Conflict I is resolvable. Uh, and I similarly, of course, uh, follow much of what he was saying about Taoist uh, thinking and its application to conflicts, conflict resolution. But I would frame it slightly differently uh, from his uh, position. And I would like to suggest, is, if you like, uh, the text or the Bible that I found quite useful for conflict resolution is a book uh, called Ways of Seeing by John Berger. John Berger was a novelist, uh, but he was an art historian too. I know it may seem rather strange. We've had a very eloquent discussion about um, uh, the philosophical basis of conflict. Uh, and now I intend to take it um, in the direction uh, of a criticism of art between 1500 and 1900 in this culture, Western culture. I make no apologies because I felt the one thing that was missing a bit in the, in the last talk was the sense it's not so much finding common ground or, or policies. Uh, we've all seen the sense of having to have a spectrum and you have components of power on one side and you have components of power on the other side and, and somehow common ground is nearer to the bigger components of power and further away from the less. Uh, <coughs> Component, uh, those that have less components of power, uh, uh, but rather uh, its image and the ability to construct an image and to construct an image that actually, if you like, uh, supersedes and goes above those poles and differences. Not necessarily so much as uh, finding the common ground, but manage, manages to transcend in a new narrative, in a new image uh, that gives a very different perspective on, on what we see. Um, uh, John, John Berger was talking basically about how we, uh, if you like, uh, stare out, how we gaze out at the world uh, about us uh, and what we see and why we see what we see. But the other important element, and this is the, the key thing that I uh, wish to come back to in the sense, is that he puts as much emphasis on how we are seen. Not just what we see and why we see it, but also how others see us. And self-awareness, I think, is the key element um, to this process. We all know, and uh, we've just heard it repeated again, um, that in a sense, looking, staring out, gazing at the political world, um, is essentially a political, a cultural act in itself. It reflects all our background, hidden, if you like, conceptualizations, our moral understandings, uh, and our culture. We do stare out of the world mostly in the West, and I'm talking about that, if you like, from uh, our sealed, a sealed uh, Cartesian retort. And a sealed Cartesian retort, which somehow for Westerners, because of the seemingly scientific basis uh, to our type of, of thinking, gives us a sense of truth and certainty that other societies do not have. And we reside in that sense of certainty uh, very strongly in terms of, of our conceptualizations. But it's also, of course, about another mental process that we have, um, uh, which has been called um, by others uh, uh, a form of figuration that we do. I could come down 
if you like, today at breakfast and say, oh, I heard a blackbird singing on the way to breakfast. Uh, of course, I don't, that's not correct. I don't mean that at all. What I heard was I heard some noise, and my brain figured that into an image of a blackbird, and I come down and I see, and I say I've seen and heard a blackbird. Actually, my figuration may be mistaken, and actually what I just heard was the ringtone of someone's cell phone. And it wasn't a blackbird at all. But nonetheless, for me, the certainty will be that I heard and saw the blackbird. Why does that have to do with us? Well, when you hear the word Iran, what is the figuration for many in Western Europe? What is the figuration? Certainly not a blackbird, but probably an embassy siege that took place in 1979 and the humiliation of the United States and its policy. Is that what comes up? These are all the things, if you like, that are in the background. But what Berger concentrates in his book uh, is the sense of otherness. Uh, we had that in terms of polarization, but I'm talking really here about otherness and how to see in the context of having otherness. Now, when I say otherness in this, I don't mean that otherness is only between, say, a Chinese culture and a Western culture, as we've seen in different philosophical outlooks. Otherness occurs within our own societies in certain ways. I remember as a very young man, very naive, with great excitement, I thought, this was great, we'd actually managed to put um, the Catholic uh, <clears throat> armed wing of the IRA in the same room as the Protestant armed wing of the IRA. This is quite long ago, and they were actually going to talk. Talking better than war, you know, this is dialogue, isn't this conflict's resolution? It was a disaster, absolute disaster, because of course, they came away from that meeting more convinced about the <coughs> inability to deal with the other, that the other was unacceptable, they would refuse to accept the otherness uh, of the other side. It took us, I think, another four years or so uh, before they could accept that there was another other, there was another truth other than their own truth. And only then politics could start, and only then, in a sense, uh, dialogue uh, was even, even possible. Well, what John Berger does and is try and illustrate how to situate otherness um, in terms of paintings, but in a particular way. Uh, he takes this uh, and he looks at the history of painting of women. He looks at it in the history of male painters gazing out on, by and large, naked women. And this is the sense in which he looks at the idea of otherness, otherness now in society, a polarization which is not a conflictual polarization, but a polarization that perhaps can be celebrated uh, rather than seen as inherently uh, conflictual. He looks in this and he tells us, in a sense, that what is most striking, if you look at all of the Renaissance paintings and the paintings over these years, what you see is that the woman who is naked and being painted is always glancing back and always glancing towards the painter who is observing her, looking at her. She's always looking at that point. And this is really an important thing, an important point that Berger is trying to, to get. The surveyor is also surveying. In other words, you, the perceiver, is also, in a sense, being perceived and understood by the subject of his view and his vision at the same time. Berger says, and I quote, 
Naked is to be oneself. To be nude is to be seen by others, and to be seen by others but not able to recognize yourself in that, if you like, mode, in that sense of seeing. What has that got to do with us? I think this is precisely the thing that we would say, uh, and I'm sure I've heard directly this from Iranians at many times, uh, after they listen to, if you like, uh, a speech in September by President Trump, in which uh, Iran is reduced to a singleness of meaning, to a singularity, if you like, of value, all its aspects uh, reduced down to a singular meaning of a, a state that is dangerous uh, and is a source of trouble and terrorism in the world today. I don't think Iran recognizes itself in this. I don't think it recognizes itself as having no aspects, no other aspects. It doesn't recognize itself um, not only in the different aspects, but in the betweenness between those aspects. So I think that this is a, a major element uh, of what I'm saying is the difficulty today. It is about recognizing otherness, not necessarily finding common ground, not eliminating otherness, but actually finding the way to recognize otherness in a way that the other feels that that otherness has been recognized. And so we are talking about something, and I've found out in most of these areas, um, is quite complex, because really what you have is the perceiver perceiving uh, the other, and the other perceiving how the original perceiver perceives it. And of course, what that does when you gaze, and you gaze in that way, whether it's at a woman or whether it's at your negotiating partner on the other side, um, that gaze actually conditions and constrains how certain forms of otherness are understood uh, and are seen by the one side. Whether it is the painter does constrain how femininity is seen uh, by the state of his gaze and also by the attitude and the way in which uh, the naked woman uh, presents herself and in presenting herself uh, set certain limits to what she would see is the way she wanted to be perceived and the way she would like the world uh, to react uh, uh, to her. I think we see this very clearly uh, in uh, the sense of if you start to see uh, your others, the states, uh, and describe them and talk of them as revisionist powers. Revisionist powers means people who will, will de definitely use violence uh, to overthrow the status quo. If you see them in that way, and that therefore they must be stopped by force, of course it is going to be limited limit your ability to understand, and also going to limit your ability to have that communications. It's going to limit, if you like, the glance of the painter uh, towards the woman that he's painting, and it's going to limit the glance that she makes back uh, towards the painter in, in return. I think this has a huge implications for what we call confidence building measures. I remember talking sometimes to someone who was about to begin, we were beginning negotiations with Iran again, and I said, you know, what do you consider to be the appropriate confidence building measure? And the answer was, well, unfreezing some of their money that's frozen. Well, I think the answer was quite different because I remember subsequently talking to the foreign minister of Brazil who had accompanied President Lula when Lula made the negotiation with Iran on the nuclear deal and successfully made it, although it was subsequently nixed by the Americans, by Condoleezza Rice, outright. But I remember him telling me, and he said, you know, we'd been negotiating with the Iranians 
quite over some time. And then suddenly we get the call. Okay, come to the Supreme Leader. I see him. Lula turned to the foreign minister and he said, you know, what do I say? You know, what am I supposed to say to the Supreme Leader? You know, what do you, what do you say to a Supreme Leader in the first place? And so they went in not knowing at all what to say. And in the end, Lula just gave him a narrative and he talked about his life in the favela. Not only favela is uh, the really poor parts of the um, Brazilian um, places like Rio, the slums, if you like, where he'd been brought up and the hardship and what he had seen there. And he explained this uh, carefully to the uh, supreme leader. And the supreme leader, at the end of this, asked him not a word about the negotiations. He just said to him, it's settled, done, finished. What had happened was that I think that in this case, uh, somehow Lulu, Lula had managed to, if you like, transcend and show an openness of consciousness and ability to hear, and therefore the Supreme Leader understood here was someone who could recognize the otherness of Iran and could therefore have a deal. The deal was minor. The point was the state of consciousness of Lula meant a level of openness and a level of knowledge which allowed transcending that polarized situation that existed uh, at the beginning. In other words, you know, the Moshid saw something special, saw something in terms of narrative, in terms of image, the image of the favela, the image of Brazil actually conveyed something that overcame the, if you like, oppositional truths about nuclear issues, the oppositional truths about um, um, the Western view of Iran, and enabled, if you like, a resolution of conflict uh, to took place. So what, Ber uh, what uh, John Berger is saying, in a sense, that when we, if you like, gaze out at the other, uh, we have to remember uh, that it gazes back at us and it looks at us and asks itself, are, are these negotiators, are these people uh, really capable of understanding the essence of who we are? Are they able to see us naked in our real essence, in who we are, with all our ambiguities, or with our femininity? Whatever it is, whether it's a woman or a state, how are they able to see it? Uh, but equally, uh, that if they see uh, that they are perceived as nude in John Berger's description, uh, as something that uh, is looked at by others, uh, but does not, it does not mean anything to themselves, that they can't recon recognize themselves uh, in this image then for sure no negotiation will take place because essentially uh, there's no communication uh, that's taken place. And I just want to see, finish with uh, one comment which in this very neoliberal world of ours that we have entered into, uh, I started um, before other negotiations, I, I used to do hostage negotiation. Hostage negotiation, I suppose, involves in the extreme of otherness um, because the otherness is both um, uh, willing not only to kill you but also to kill or execute your victim uh, at a short notice. But when you do hostage negotiation, uh, you don't uh, question whether the hostage takers will have credibility or legitimacy, or if you're giving them extra power in this process, what do you do? You open communications, and you open communications as soon as you can, because you know, the history shows you if you can't open communications within a week, then it will probably be two or three years. That's historically the right, before you'll be able to, to communicate um, and talk. And when we open communications, we try and spend our effort to form a rapport with 
the hostage takers. We talk to them narratives, we talk to them in narratives about the hostage, and also they tell us about their narratives, and we try and obtain those narratives back for them. In other words, we try and transform their understanding of reality just as they're trying to transform us understanding of reality. And sometimes you can get to a point of, if you like, of a narrative, an image that allows you to get a success. Not always, I very much regret to say. But my question is, what's happened to all these truths, these very obvious things that I'm saying? I know they're banal in many ways, but in a new world of neoliberalism, where you're either with us or you're against us, where you're a revisionist power or you're with the United States, the polarized sense of it has affected all of the negotiations um, uh, in this period. How do we get back to, if you like, uh, the earlier understanding, and an understanding that is not very different to what the first speaker was saying in terms of, of the otherness and polarity, except I'm saying, you know, actually, when you get into the negotiations, the aim is actually to be able to celebrate that polarity, to understand the polarity, absorb the polarity, and transcend the polarity. Thank you very much.